around here. Look at that nice shadow raking across those pillars. You got the perfect one point perspective right here. It's like it was made for me. Probably sound like a real douche saying shit like that, but. All right, so today I'm gonna do a little test to see if my Canon R5 can replace my Sony a7R4 as my main architecture photography camera. I have made, oops, losing lens caps there. I've made a ton of money shooting architecture with this camera, but uh, the R5 has been the better camera for almost everything else, different types of photography and video. So I wanna see if it could replace the Sony. The Sony obviously has more resolution. 45 megapixels is, I mean, it's probably more than enough, more than anyone really needs. And so it's really more about testing the dynamic range of the cameras, because the Sony a7R4, it's like a cheat code with how good the dynamic range is. And I haven't really tested the Canon so far in architectural settings, but I'm gonna do that today. And we're gonna use my favorite lens of all time, the Canon 50 millimeter tilt shift lens. This is the epitome of perfection in optics. And I always tell myself that anytime that I get to use this lens, it's a great day. Today's a great day. The light's gonna set that way. It doesn't look like we're gonna get any direct light on that building. Let me see, let me pull out the, uh, the Sun Seeker app really quick. Okay, so maybe, maybe at closer to six, that sets that way. We'll get some light on that. But if not, I'll just, uh, I might just shoot this building right here because it's got some nice shadows. So I might just do this right now. And uh, yeah, I'll just have to clone those fuckers out. Wait for the sun. So we lost a little bit of the sun because it went behind the cloud, but as soon as it's completely out again, we're gonna see some nice sharp shadows on the facade of this building which is a huge relief because it was raining earlier and I was worried I would have to draw those in post. And we just lost the sun again, so I probably look better, but the building does not. So the EVF on the Canon, I haven't shot the Sony in, in a while, and I can already tell you that the EVF on the Canon R5 is so much better than, the, than on the R4 for the Sony. When it comes to, to architecture, really, like cameras, they don't really make much of a difference because you're focusing manually um, you're shooting at higher f-stops usually f10 f11 so everything's gonna be sharp everything's gonna be in focus there's not gonna be any real distinct optical advantage in image quality um, but with Canon lenses or I should say with Canon cameras you are gonna be able to use Canon tilt shift lenses Sony does have adapters but um, I'm currently using my Laowa 17 millimeter as a shift adapter and that only works on Sony cameras Otherwise, it's just a 12 millimeter lens So if I were to make this my permanent architecture solution I would have to also probably buy the Canon 17 tilt shift which it's Canon so it's expensive um, Right now we just have like a perfect one-point perspective of this building We've got some nice shadows raking across uh, the facade here on these like Greek light -like columns and um, it's actually a pretty simple shot. Like, I don't have to bracket. I'm not gonna have to really uh, do multiple exposures. It'll probably be a really quick um, Photoshop edit. Probably just do a sky replacement. And because I'm using a tilt shift lens and this uh, Arca Swiss Cube, my shot's pretty much gonna be level in camera. All right, so the advantages of shooting on a tilt shift lens, if you're not familiar, is that it allows you to keep your vertical lines straight. Now there are two components to a tilt shift lens. You have the shift option and the tilt option. The tilt option is what people use when they want to get those miniature effects in camera, when you have like everything looking small and you have a very narrow, thin uh, field of focus. I don't really use that too much for architecture, but what really 
matters is the shift function, which is right here. So you can see as I rotate these knobs, the lens shifts up, shifts down, and you can even rotate it. So you can shift in a variety of uh, different directions. And this comes in handy for a lot of different applications. Obviously it allows you to um, change the perspective, the field of view of the camera without having to actually tilt the, the camera's axis. So that's when the lines converge and you get like crooked verticals. This allows you to keep your vertical straight in camera so you don't have to chew through your resolution fixing them in post. But it also helps you get uh, compositions that are otherwise kind of impossible to get because sometimes you might have a wall or something in the frame and you can't physically move the camera to a certain spot but you can still shift the lens to the right, to the left. Um, you can get really high resolution panoramas. I do this all the time when I'm shooting in rooms that have um, really tall ceilings. I might just do one shot for the foreground and then shift up and then stitch it in post so I can get uh, everything in one shot. Um, so these are very specialty lenses. I wouldn't recommend just anybody buying them. If you're not shooting architecture for a living, you probably don't need one, but they are really cool and the optics inside them are second to none. As far as like stills glass goes, uh, these are some of the sharpest, uh, cleanest, free of chromatic aberration, uh, free of distortion, uh, just perfect straight out of camera lenses you could probably buy. Probably Canon's like uh, masterpieces, I would say, as far as lenses. And I would probably put the 50 RF in there as well, but I'd still, if I had to be buried with one lens, it would be the 50 millimeter Canon tilt shift and then the 24, which is what I use more often because it's a wider lens. Um, it's made me a lot of money, but the 50 has a special place in my heart. And because it's a Canon 50 millimeter tilt shift lens, it's like barely any distortion, if at all, like, because it's, it's perfect. And I'm gonna shoot this shot before we get kicked out. Hey man, that's pretty much the shot. I'm, if, I were, if I were to do anything else, I might just wait for these people to move somewhere else so that I could paint them out in Photoshop because normally I do like having people in my architecture. Um, it adds a sense of scale to the image so you can see how tall something is in comparison because a human person is something that's constant. It's a constant variable. We all know how tall people should be. But these people are ugly. Like they're wearing ugly clothes and they have this tacky ass umbrella. Like I don't know what they're doing. So it's not really gonna do anything for me. So I'm just gonna wait and see if they move. Um, or if we get kicked out, whatever happens first. So we're really not supposed to be here. So we just uh, took a little tour of the campus here at Redlands uh, University and same building back there, but just a little bit of height and elevation reveals these mountains in the background that are beautifully lit. So if we can get this cloud to clear, pray that it does, we're gonna have some really nice light raking across the building, across the lawn, mountains in the background, and I have my 100 millimeter macro lens, which is not a tilt shift lens, but we're high enough that I shouldn't matter too much. I won't have to do too much uh, vertical correction and it should should produce a really nice image. So that's, uh, oh, I think it's happening and it's happening. We're gonna use the Canon 100 macro. What are you shooting your iPhone, bro? Huh? What are you shooting your iPhone like that? Not enough megapixels, bro. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, manual focusing on the R5. One other benefit of the R5 for architecture that I've noticed too is that the, um, the touch screen is way more usable than the A7R4. So it makes transitioning between functions and shooting modes a lot faster because on the Sony, the touchscreen is pretty much useless. Like, 
why bother having it? Yeah, because on Sony, you can actually go through the menu. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, here, like, you can go through the whole menu on the touchscreen. So, like, for example, if I wanted to go into the regular shooting mode versus the time mode versus the continuous mode versus, you know, I can change all my autofocus points and in focus. I can even change my, uh, my white balance in this same menu right here. All managed through the touchscreen. Whereas on the Sony, you would have to go through all the buttons. It's really less about the image quality at this point when it comes to shooting architecture for me, but more about the functionality of the, uh, of the camera, how fast and easy it is for me to operate. And of course, since I'm kind of transitioning into RF lenses, making less sense to, to keep the Sony. Um, so I might just sell it and maybe get it like an R6 or whatever Canon comes out with as my second architecture camera. Because when you're shooting architecture, you definitely want two bodies um, for several reasons. One, um, sometimes you have to leave your tripod locked in a certain area, maybe up to two or three hours. And if you only have one camera, uh, you can't get other shots. So uh, what I like to do is I like to have one camera locked off for like a hero shot. And then I like to shoot handheld with the second camera, just walk around with like a tighter lens. And that way I can just be more productive throughout the day. But also it happens if like a camera breaks or just doesn't work one day on set um, and you don't have a backup, you're gonna look like a complete idiot in front of your client because these shoots are months in the making. They go through a lot of preparation for organizing, for staging, uh, for making sure the location is clean. A lot of times, like when I shoot uh, on the cruise ships, for example, you're in the middle of nowhere. You're like in a port town in Germany or a shipyard in, uh, in Italy and th there's no camera shops there. There's no B&H out there, I'll tell you that much. So if something happens, um, the client just flew you out there, you know, just spent $10,000 arranging everything for you to get out there and you don't have a backup, you're pretty much committing career suicide. So if you're going to shoot architecture or my personal opinion, if you're going to shoot anything, have two bodies. So for those of you in my YouTube comments who are asking like, do you really need, you know, C70 and R5 and a Komodo? Uh, yeah, if you're making money off of this, you should have more than one camera. We got a different, slightly higher perspective right now, but we lost the light. So I'm glad that I actually got that shot below for safety. Now let's just hope that we get that last ounce of sunlight <laughs> because we have this uh, large uh, swath of clouds coming in. And once those clouds come in, we're probably just gonna lose light until sunset, so. Oh, perfect, look at that. We got like that last bit of light on the building, just kind of giving us an outline. Unfortunately, I don't have that same dramatic shadow raking across the facade of the building like I did in the first shot. So I am gonna cheat it. I'm gonna recreate it in Photoshop to the best of my abilities. If it's trash, I won't post it. If it's convincing. Um, actually, I'll probably just cut this out and let you decide because I don't want people to know that I did that. <clears throat> Yo, this looks sick, man. This is gonna be a sick shot. Shoot this shot with the Sony now, but we got some really nice light in this building behind us, and I'm afraid we'll miss it out. We'll miss out on it, so we're just gonna. Uh oh, security. Let's, uh, let's pretend we're walking. Bing. So, on second thought, um, the perspective just isn't right. Um, we're too close to the building, so even with the widest lens, we might not get the whole thing in. And even if we did, it would just look hella distorted and it would kind of look like Frankenstein, Dracula's castle because it would just kind of loom over us. Um, which would be cool if we're shooting like a horror film or something. You know, if we're shooting like Scream or something on this campus, which would be awesome. I would go for a shot like that, but if I'm just going to submit this to an architect, like it's probably not the best look for the building. So, I don't know. I think we're good. We lost light anyway, so I don't think we're getting it back. Just one small benefit from the R5. It closes on itself and it protects itself. 
Whereas with the Sony screen, I'm always kind of worried about how I'm gonna pack it because I'm always worried something in my bag might crush against it, lean against it and scratch it or crack it. Um, this is a very well thought out piece of design. So we're just gonna see how this looks, see if it's worth it. I'm gonna shoot this on the, probably on the 24 tilt shift, which I haven't pulled out yet today, but it is my main money maker lens. I actually think this little photo excursion is all I needed to convince me to uh, just ditch the Sony. Sony, trash. Sony is complete trash, 100%. It's trash. So I think upon further inspection, I might wanna go a little bit to the right and see how easy that was. I didn't even have to move the tripod. Just shifting the lens. I got a much cleaner composition. What I probably will do put some grass in the foreground in Photoshop because it looks a little ugly there, but otherwise this shot is um, kind of perfect the way it is. It's actually, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable sometimes when, when I'm shooting in the right conditions and all it takes is like one snap of the camera because it makes me feel like I'm not doing enough. But when you shoot at the right time of day, uh, those are the results. Uh, you can shoot and be done in time to go get some whiskey. Let's go do that.